Peter, if I can um, kick off with a general question to you, but to, to the others as well. Obviously, um, investment uh, is, at, is at the centre of, uh, greater investment is at the centre of your report. Um, how do you characterise AXS 200 uh, approach to investment in India now, and what needs to change? And I'll ask uh, Shamara and Ashok to follow up as well. Yeah, well, I think, um the too hard perspective of India, which is uh, more broadly anchored in the business community, also has uh, uh, real echoes in, at the top end of town as well. Uh, now, that's, that doesn't apply in all cases, and there's some very significant um, exceptions to that. But I think uh, this once bitten, twice shy view of India is still quite well entrenched. Uh, certainly, that was the, the view I heard when we went around consulting. Um, so I think um, it's important for uh, the business community and particularly for the larger Australian companies because they're the ones that are more likely to have an offshore global perspective to have uh, a better understanding of what is actually happening now in India as opposed to what may have been rather difficult experiences in the past, which is not to say that the future is all, you know, sweetness and light and everything's honky-dory, but um, there are major changes that are taking place in India. There are already major changes that have taken place, and I think the trend line is clearly in the direction of uh, making it easier to do business on the ground and policy settings that are less regulated and more open than what we've been used to. Shamara, do you have a perspective from Macquarie's experience in India and in Asia? Um, yeah, and I, I do think it has to be tailored to every business and their strategy and where their global priorities are. Um, and the other thing I would say is, yes, there's a great commitment now in India and the environment's changing a lot, but our experience in India and a lot of other markets we invest in is that it's got to be very tailored and it's got to be a patient, long-term commitment um, with local partners and with local staff. Um, and um, you know, I'm happy to talk later about what we've done with Macquarie, but we now have 1,300 people in Macquarie and um, Peter used the word back office, but we have a lot of people. I wouldn't call it back office at all. We have finance teams there and operational teams there who are phenomenal. All my colleagues who go there are quite inspired by seeing how much initiative they take and people from um, our Indian operations have now moved around the world to support us in the US and Mexico and other parts. And then um, we have 100 people doing stockbroking, corporate finance advisory, commodities financing and trading in our infrastructure funds. But we started with partners like State Bank of India and IFC in our funds and then a number of partners in our assets like Ashoka in our roads or the Rao family and GMR in our airport. So, um, our experience is you know, long-term, patient, local sensitivity, partners, staff, et cetera, has been the way it's worked for us. Ashok, your views? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so I think it makes perfect sense for the ASX 200 to have focused on Australia for, you know, for the past 20 to 30 years. Australia has been a happy hunting ground for investment returns. Uh, any ASX 200 company that wanted to invest aggressively in Asia would have been penalized by the market aggressively. So, I mean, the, the, the philosophy of every CEO here has been the grass is greener on my side of the fence. Now, is it, is it going to change? I mean, the point, the point is that no one has invested in Asia, let alone India. So India is just one of many countries in, in, in Asia that has not received uh, you know, virtually any outbound investment from here. I mean, is that going to change? The, the, I think the, the point, the big point that comes out from Peter's report is that India is, you know, the third largest contributor to GDP growth in the world today. And it's only a matter of time before China and India will, between the two of them, provide almost half of all global, you know, global growth. So it's an opportunity for, for, uh, for a large organization or large or medium-sized organization to invest capital that will compound for the long run. I mean, India is a structural growth story. It will grow at six, seven, eight, nine percent 
for probably decades to come, there is no more explosive structural growth story than India, and that's the reason why it is a market that has to be looked at very carefully. Shamara. Bishop Shamara, Peter spoke uh, towards the end of his speech about the need to maintain momentum uh, in relation to India, both, I presume, Peter, at a government as well as a business level. Um, how has Macquarie done it, given that uh, I think all four of us on this panel know that that's not been uh, characteristic of all business activity in India? Um, yeah, well, we basically, and Peter um, set this scene in his report by saying focus on states, focus on sectors. Um, we have expertise in infrastructure and in energy, and that's where we have really focused to try and engage with India and see what we can bring. And we've also focused deeply on particular states that are conducive to what we're trying to do. Um, so for us, we've invested in um, a lot of the southern states like um, Andhra Pradesh, um, Karnataka, um, a little bit into Tamil Nadu, and then the eastern states, like Maharashtra, that you've been to a lot, and Gujarat. Um, but if you were a mining company, you'd probably be investing more in the eastern states, like Orissa, um, Chhattisgarh, etc., cetera, um, which are more conducive to mining. So it's been very locally led by our people on the ground where they see opportunity for our business. And then, as I said previously, it's been patient, long-term growth where we've had to engage with... Um, both the public sector and the private sector side to build our business. And um, in terms of what we do in infrastructure investing, it's more a private equity type investing approach. So it's not as simple as buying the index. And I hear exactly what you say, Ashok, that India is going to have very high growth with volatility, as Peter said in his report. Um, but for us, it's going a lot deeper into sectors and trying to understand what India needs for its growth and how we can participate in that by bringing expertise and capital in infrastructure and energy investment. But Peter, which goes to the issues of um, India or Asia literacy amongst the business community here, um, how, do we, how do we improve that in boardrooms in particular and also C-suites? But, but you know, given what I joked about earlier at the start about the significant transformation that Modi's embarked upon in India, uh, whose responsibility is it to get that information and the opportunities those reforms create for investment and trade uh, on this side of the Indian Ocean to our business community? Yeah, well, I, I don't think India literacy is um, sort of a goal in and of itself. Um, but. Uh, because of the, the scale of what's happening in India is so important, for, including for the reasons Ashok pointed out, um, there needs to be a much better level of understanding about what is happening in India, what's driving it, and how it's likely to pan out. And it needs to be a realistic understanding too, not a kind of a boosterism about India. Now, I think um, the obligations to get to that better understanding probably fall on a number of shoulders. Uh, I think the government does have a role to play uh, in uh, pointing to what is happening and why it matters. In other words, a narrative there from the government I think is quite important. Uh, but I think businesses themselves need to be, at the very least, just asking themselves the question, is this a market that we should be looking at seriously? Uh, and in order for them to answer that question, they need to have a reasonably good understanding of the nature of the market for their particular interests and their particular uh, business. Um, so I think there is a, there is a, uh, a responsibility uh, in the boardrooms uh, for that question to be posed uh, and for uh, an answer to, to be framed. And then I think, you know, the sort of institutions in Australia that traditionally have played a big role uh, in um, promoting uh, knowledge and research and understanding, which I'm thinking here of universities and think tanks and so on. I mean, I think, I think we, uh, we should be putting a greater effort through those institutions into an India focus. Because if anything, India literacy in Australia, at least in universities, has gone backwards rather than forward, forwards. We, we actually had uh, many more courses in Indian history and culture and civilizations in the 1960s than we do today. Ashok, just building on Peter's response there, given his report and your comments earlier highlight um, 
India's growth rate, which is far more significant than Australia. Uh, why does business, why do super funds, why do investment uh, uh, brokers have a, have a hesitation about investing in India? Well, in, India is, uh, I mean, investing in India on a long-term basis, and, and to be quite honest, Macquarie is the only organization here and one of the only large international organizations that's done it. It's a little bit like climbing a wall of worry. When you, when you look at it, there are too many reasons not to, not to go into it. Uh, the bureaucracy, red tape, uh, uh, corruption to an extent. There's, there's many reasons that you know, why an investor, especially in this modern era of compliance, uh, would say, look, it's in the too hard basket. But what, it's not too hard anymore. Possibly it's still hard. But what you now have is a is a evening out in the risk reward side. What what has changed over the last five to ten years is that the Indian economy has emerged. Modi has 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 has, has sort of ignited it, and we've now got a a, a scenario with with GST coming in, the identity card, uh, and things like that, where you the growth rate of potentially six to seven to eight percent is structurally locked in on an intergenerational basis. So the reward from being invested in India is, 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 is much less risky than it used to be, because I think these growth rates are embedded into the system. At the center, the government has worked very, very hard to make India a more investable de destination. And, and, and beyond no illusions, whether it's the Japanese, the Koreans, the Canadians, they are pouring tens of billions, in some case, like, you know, potentially even, you know, not far south of $100 billion of investments into that market. Australia has been a, you know, a great, great place to, to stay at home. So there hasn't been the need, <laughs> there hasn't been the need to, to, to take the risk. I think those, those you know, things are changing. And, and, and I think, you know, if any CEO, uh, any board, that does not take a good hard look at India will be asked in 10 years time, did you at least look at it? Did you visit the place? Did you know what your competitors or your market, markets in India looked like? And, and you know, there, there will be some looking back in a decade's time and, and, and a, a, an organization here may look at it and not invest in it, which is fine, but not looking at it in my view would be a crime. Shamara, are you prepared to answer the question as to why Macquarie's committed to its long-term strategy and, and some of your competitors and others in the sector don't seem to be as, uh, uh, as, as keen or as enthusiastic? Um, well, look, we make um, two-thirds of our earnings now outside of Australia, and I hear what Ashok says about Australia having been a great place to invest, but it's a small place. It's a $1.5 trillion economy in an $80 trillion world, and you know, you get to the point where to grow and have impact, you have to go outside this country. So it's not just India, we're in 28 countries. Um, we went to India in 2004, and we did that in a very patient way. We have 3,500 people in Asia, and 98% of them are local to not just Asia, but the countries in Asia that they live and work in and drive our business in. Um, so we had that imperative of needing to have impact meant we had to go outside Australia. And the Aussie super pool at the moment is heading towards three trill. You know, it's now double our GDP practically. It's heading to six and nine trillion. So I think Australian investors will just for the volume of money they need to get invested have to start looking outside of this country. Um, and, um, you know, as Peter said in his report, and Ashok has said, India is a country where there's very high growth. I think the reason people have been reluctant with India from Australia is that the risks have been high historically. Things are starting to change now. Um, but, um, you know, it's a difficult market, especially in our sector with infrastructure where you're making long-term investments. Currency has fluctuated. It's been hard to hedge. Um, the hedging costs are high because the interest rate differentials are high, but there's no liquidity in the market beyond two years, and you're going into 10-year assets. So there have been all sorts of challenges in going there, and we have gone very slowly and very patiently. We started with 
As I said, in 04, we had a stockbroking business and we started putting people in in the finance sector. We gradually, adjacently, baby step by baby step, grew that business. We now have three funds investing in India. And we have about $3 billion of our investors' money invested, driving good returns. Um, India is a place, again, in Peter's report you talked about, I think the numbers you had are by 2040. They have $4.5 trillion they need invested in infrastructure. And there's a shortfall that the public sector can't deliver. So they need the private sector to come and invest. And as Ashok said, a lot of other countries are onto this now. Um, the UAE is a big investor into the um, National Infrastructure Investment Fund that the government has set up. Uh, Japan is investing via JICA. The Singaporeans are investing. Um, those uh, countries are coming more on a government-to-government -government basis. As Peter said in his report, Australia is more of a business-to-business -business country, but um, there is scope for the public sector to work with us. We've had a lot of help from the High Commissioner, from DFAT, in terms of helping us uh, navigate regulatory systems and arrange introductions, private sector introductions. So um, even though it is a business-to-business -business approach that um, our economy uses, uh, the public sector has also had a role to play and help. So, so I think, Macquarie, you know, the short answer to your question is, we went because we had to. You know, there was imperative to grow and we had grow, outgrown everything we could do here um, to impact our returns for shareholders. Peter, is there a role for government in trying to encourage greater investment in, in India? And I, what I'm thinking of is that, you know, if the super funds aren't going to go on their own, and it's one of the great assets that this country has, the amount of money we have in those funds, uh, and it's a great opportunity to compete with uh, uh, the, the Singapore's and the Japan's and the, the Canada's and the others who are investing heavily into India. You know, should a Premier or a Prime Minister lead a delegation um, to India so that it exposes the, the funds to what's on offer? Well, I think, I think there is a role uh, for government and it's quite a significant role. I mean, I, I've shied away from an Australia Inc. approach in my report because I think um, it's not in our business culture or our government culture or DNA, but um, the principles behind uh, an Australia Inc. approach, which is to have a more coordinated strategy, I think is still highly relevant. So I think government has a role in um, promoting a narrative about opportunity, necessarily a broad brush narrative because investment decisions need to be made with much greater uh, granularity. Uh, I think it is important that we have targeted business delegations going to India and I think the more we can do that on a sectoral basis the better. Uh, I'm less a fan of, you know, bringing a caravan of four, five, six hundred business people uh, to a market like India. But I think if you prepare the ground carefully, if you uh, are shrewd about whom you choose to meet with, the imprimatur of a government minister or a prime minister can certainly have an impact in a market like India. Uh, Peter, if I could just go back to you, though. Um, uh, uh at the heart of your report is a desire for greater coordination between government and business in approaching the challenges you've outlined and the goals you've set. Um, to put it bluntly, do you think both government and business have the attention span and the commitment to do that? Well, I think the fact that the government commissioned a 20-year strategy um, is a pretty good start. Uh, it shows that they uh, are keen to uh, take a longer-term view. Um, I think, I think in any system, uh, developing and sustaining a long-term strategy uh, is, going to be, is going to be a challenge. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm ever the optimist in these sorts of areas. And I think, um, I think the more the issues and the opportunities and the constraints can be considered, the more likely we are to get people to start thinking longer term about what they should be doing. Ashok, how do, we, how do we get senior business figures in this country to take India seriously and to commit to long-term um, involvement with it? So I think there are two things that are required. One is the ignition, and, and there needs to be an ignition button pressed by someone with the power to press that. And that, by and large, can only be government or leading asset owners in this country. So that, that's, that's, that's hard, depending on where you stand in the political cycle. We're at the end of this one, so maybe, maybe it's a year away. But, but 
what the government can do is is explain the narrative very clearly and 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 what we don't what what no one's expecting is is a deluge of investment capital headed from australia to india that's not going to happen overnight but at the moment there's there's not even a trickle and uh, and the ignition has not been pressed so ignition button so so i so what it's like it's a little bit like eating an elephant there's the only way to do it is one bite at a time yeah. and 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 that's that that first bite needs to be taken and the government needs to put that enormous effort into almost the government can never tell a superannuation fund where to invest i mean australia has got a fantastic system and and tampering with that is extremely dangerous but what the government can do is encourage asset owners institutions and big business to accompany them quite re regularly on a sector by sector basis on a state by state basis you know probably for a couple of years to get the full engagement of of the decision makers here so that everybody's looked at it and made the decision yes i like it or i don't that's fine if we get to the point where someone says i don't want to go forward but at this point it, th there's no there's no movement at all so if we're not even at that point do you have a view shamara um, yeah, I mean, I guess the only thing I'd add is it's probably also the duty of us pioneers who've been there for a bit to be helping the super funds and people come and understand the risks and de-risk it and, and show some track record of managing it for them. Um, because I agree with what Ashok says, the people managing the super funds have got responsibility to their members and have to weigh up risk versus return in terms of where they allocate their capital. And I think the responsibility of intermediaries like us is to help connect all that capital with community need and deeply understand what's going on in India and how you add value in India as well as for the investor. Um, you know, so as an example, for example, renewable energy is something that India wants to get to 175 megawatts in, which leaves a 100 meg gap. There's a lot of investment needed in that. There's a lot of expertise from Australia that can be brought to that. Um, we need to be bringing our investors along. We did have some early investors in India in 2009 when we went there, one big one, but since then they've actually preferred to come and get exposure to India through Pan-Asian funds that we have because they feel that's a little bit more de-risked where the manager has a mandate to invest wherever in Asia is the best opportunity at the time. But I think the only thing I'd add is that those of us that have gone before probably have a bit of a duty now to bring others along to help bite the elephant off a bit. <laughs> Peter, um, Team effort. you've suggested that Australia put its energies behind the broader Asian attempt to engage India in trade and investment, um, the RCEP. Um, is it time to finally admit that the seeker or free trade agreement is dead, to bury it, get it off the table and not allow it to continue to be a stumbling block between Australia and India in trying to do trade deals? Well, what I've... Um, suggested in the report is that we shift our primary focus from uh, the bilateral FTA to the RCEP negotiations uh, because I don't think um, in the near term uh, we are able to get this agreement across the line uh, and so I think the best uh, way of um, approaching it is to see what we can get out of an RCEP negotiation. And I think, I think the Indian position is to put a higher priority on RCEP than on the bilateral negotiation. So irrespective of where our commitment lands, um, it takes two to make an agreement. Now, I think RCEP does have the prospect of addressing uh, quite positively market access and investment issues. Uh, it's not going to do it uh, to the full satisfaction of Australia. Uh, given the nature of uh, those involved in the RCEP negotiations. Uh, and if at the end of an RCEP negotiation, which I hope we will see a successful conclusion to it, uh, there remain important market access and investment protection issues uh, that are unaddressed, then I think we can return to the bilateral negotiation. But I think, I think that sequencing, to my mind, is a more sensible and pragmatic approach. Ashok, the other part of the India-Australia relationship that's to some extent underdone, notwithstanding the numbers, is education. Um, and I noticed Sydney University and their business school are here today, great supporters of CEDA but also of the relationship. What do we need to do to try and get um, uh, university education and, and higher degrees more valued by 
potential Indian students to Australia? That, that India's, just like China's obsession is with Australia, India's obsession is with the US. And as a consequence of that, the, the aspirational students are going from India to the US. That's why Silicon Valley is one third Indian today. Uh, what, what the strategy of government needs to be to get, to change the, the mix from affordability to uh, aspirational. That is, you know, a, a, a project that, that has to be coordinated but can only be coordinated by government uh, because at this point in time, our education system floats off on the back of Chinese and Indian students. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a machine that, that, that is relentless, that needs every dollar, and, 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 and it's uh, like a river of gold for a university at any level, the top, medium, or low. And, and that's not going to change unless the government decides that it wants to change the mix and has a policy around more scholarships, more marketing, uh, you know, all those sort of things. But again, I think that's pretty important if we want to get a better quality uh, a student from India in Australia. And Peter, is that a, um, another benefit of what you're proposed in terms of greater investment in the university sector as well as the uh, Australia Research Fund, Australia India Research Fund? Yeah, well, my, my recommendations on education is that we need to think much more broadly than just bringing Indian students to Australian institutions. So I've outlined a, a kind of a migration plus approach to education. We will, we will, we will always have, I think, a strong stream of Indian students coming to Australia primarily with a migration objective. What we need to do is to position Australia more up the quality chain so that they think about Australia as a quality education destination, not just a migration education destination. And then I think we also need to uh, look at what role we can play in partnership with India as it deals with this extraordinary challenge of upskilling 400 million people. Uh, so we need to think about education more in partnership terms as well. And I think Australia can make a contribution, certainly on the vocational education side, but also can make a contribution in terms of the digital delivery of education because you're not going to upskill 400 million people through bricks and mortar institutions. You're only going to be able to do it essentially off digital platforms. And I think we do have something to contribute to India's strategy in dealing with that. So it's a much, it's a much broader approach to education than simply a numbers game. We now come to questions from the floor. Um, down the end, where, where are my helpers? Table 16 and then table 5. Thank you. Um, my name is Susai Benjamin. I'm representing this um, afternoon, the Blacktown City Council. I'm an elected councillor. Um, just uh, uh, two two issues. The first one is about yeah, one. Uh, one would be good to start with, and if yeah, we get I know, but I, I just make one. it two. Just I'm make not it after easier. vote, so I'll be tough today. Uh, <laughs> one is about the legal system in India. It's a it's a it's a grave concern to me. I'm a lawyer, and I've been there many times. I've been here 32 years, and uh, this is something I'm not too sure whether the report, uh, I just got the book, I've not read it, and, uh, and I agree with everything Peter has said on all range of issues. Um, the legal issues is a, a fundamental issue. When people have uh, disputes, they go to the court, and that's what they do. Um, and uh, that's a big, big, big issue, uh, and then uh, I think we need to do something about how we can assist that. Second issue is the public funding for uh, elections. And Barry, as you know from the political uh, experience, wide experience, uh, funding uh, is an important issue. Public funding in India, I think, is something to be looked at uh, so that uh, we can uh, uh, come over some of the issues that uh, um, Ashok has indicated. So some comments, that's all. Thank you. Peter. Uh, well, I think, I, think, I, give those to you. I think public funding of elections is entirely a matter for India, and I don't think... Um, Pontification by me on it will uh, will get us anywhere. The, the, the legal system is a genuine uh, uh, area of concern to the extent that it is riddled with uh, delays. Uh, 
I mean, in, India has a very recognizable legal system because it's modeled uh, on the same found foundation as our own legal system. For the most part, I think the principles of the rule of law are well embedded in uh, Indian legal culture. Uh, but a court system where your average delays you know, are five years plus uh, does make the value of a contract somewhat academic. So uh, I, think, I think this is an issue which uh, the government itself, the Indian government itself, is very focused on, and it does require uh, a substantial increase in the resourcing of the court system across India, uh, as well as the modernization of processes and technology that underpin uh, the legal system. So question from number five, then we'll go to the Consul General on table one. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Partha Mukherjee. I'm the chair of education chapter for Australia-India Business Council. We are very excited about this report. I've been reading it for last one week. Uh, last <laughs> it's a 500-page report with lots of recommendation. <laughs> last uh, Friday, we had a fantastic uh, uh, kickstart of our education chapter in New South Wales, in which we found 18 very good recommendations from Peter's report. Now, we are very keen to actually implement at least a couple of them, if not all 18. So my question to Peter is that, what's your thought for the next step in terms of the implementation and how AIBC and our education chapter can actually partner with you and any others to deliver some of these recommendations and ASAP? Well, I'm in the very fortunate position of um making recommendations and then not worrying, not worrying about their implementation. Um, but I have, I have made some recommendations on the implementation of recommendations in my, in my report. Uh, and and that includes, that includes uh, the Trade Minister chairing a cabinet level committee uh, to oversight implementation. Because th these are recommendations which are, uh, are not all going to be, and indeed all cannot be, implemented straight away. Uh, some of them can be done quickly, but a number of them will take more time and certainly more resources. So uh, I think it's important for the government to have a process for uh, looking at, examining and responding to the recommendations, and I'm uh, very satisfied that the government is serious about that. To the extent that I make recommendations that go to the business community, I hope very much that they are picked up by the relevant bodies in the, in the, in the business community and similarly uh, when we, when the report makes recommendations about the way uh, universities, for instance, should position themselves in India, that they would give that serious consideration. But um, uh, I, I don't think there's going to be uh, uh, a single kind of marshaller of recommendation implementations in it. Consul General. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Van Nelvona. I'm the Consul General of India in Sydney. Uh, firstly, uh, let me thank uh, Sida. Uh, for organizing this uh, really, really informative session. And we also congratulate uh, Mr. Vergis and the government of Australia for the great initiative in bringing uh, the relationship between our two great countries into focus, into the mindset of the larger Australian community. So really, thank you for that. Uh, I, uh, my question is uh, to Ms. Samara. Uh, I don't know if you remember, we had met uh, when our finance minister visited in 2016 uh, in the beginning of 2016. And since then, of course, uh, a lot of our focus has been on trying to encourage, uh, particularly those from the financial sector, including the super funds, to look at India more, uh, more seriously and to, to look for opportunities in India because we genuinely believe that India is expanding. There are opportunities which are being seized by uh, similarly placed economies and we feel that Australia was not doing enough. So therefore, there was a backdrop in which we've been trying to encourage our Australian friends to go to India. And uh, as a result of that, of course, the government also has been uh, you know, uh, making transformative changes. One of the la latest one was the introduction of a portal called the India Investment Grid, where uh, an, a, a, an organization called Invest India, which is under the Department of Investment and Pro Pro Promotion and Publicity, uh, which has launch a portal where investors can log in and see live projects and pick and choose from that. And recently, as recently as last month, we have our commerce minister who was visiting here. Again, in Sydney, our primary focus was to interact with the fund managers. So I'm looking for two pieces of advice from you. Of course, the panel have already touched upon what Australian government could do. Our belief in 
interested in hearing from you what we as government representatives and other stakeholders who are in the India Australia economic relationship space could do more to encourage our friends in Australia. This is my first piece of advice. The other piece of advice which I want you to give to the fund managers is what kind of advice would you give? Because you have been our success story in India, one of the champion. That is the reason why we are not so happy with your promotion, but congratulations to you anyway. Uh, uh, so, uh, so what, kind of, what kind of advice could you possibly, possibly give from your perspective as having been the most successful uh, Australian invest, investor in India. Thank you. Um, so to answer both of those questions, the first one was, and we really appreciated meeting with the minister and um, access we've had to Indian ministers generally, including the prime minister, because it helps us understand what objectives India has and how we can be delivering. Um, but the first question was, how do we get more Australians investing there? And since that meeting, we actually have invested another 1.6 billion in India through our funds, and we have had some Australian investors coming into that. But as I was mentioning earlier, what we moved to doing is having pan-Asian mandates in the funds. And so the investors um, basically were relying on us to make the risk return call of where to invest when. And as part of that, we've invested portions of those funds into India, including the recent TOT road portfolio, um, the national, from um, the National Highway Authority. So we have 53 investments now in India and many of them made since that. So it's, uh, as I said earlier, it's a long patient journey. Um, and I think, you know, we have to accept that it's going to take time. I think the reforms that are being made now are helping a lot. So things like demonetization, GST, etc., cetera, um, to bring people more into the formal economy and create an investment environment that's going to attract much more foreign investment um, is definitely working. So not just money from um, Australia, but we've got Canadians, Dutch, a lot of our um, investors are now investing into these funds that are accessing India. So I think, I think we're on the right path. Um, and also, it's not just central government. Obviously, the national government's very important in policy setting, but as we've been discussing, state by state as well, a lot of the regulations and the real impact for where you're investing are driven there. Um, and equally, we need to be thinking about what India needs, um, and that's why those meetings have been useful. Things like the focus on more renewable energy. Um, one of the things we've been doing with the National Highway Authority is focusing a lot on safety on roads, which has lost too many lives of staff. We have 17,000 people working for us in our assets in India. We had a year where we had five fatalities and you know people losing their lives working on roads because you couldn't cordon off the way people worked, and we work with the National Highway Authority a lot too. We've had 5,000 hours invested in safety now. Um, so we really appreciate the engagement that we're getting from India. We're trying to reciprocate, but it's a, it's a patient journey. We're 14 years into it, and just because my job's changed, I'm not going to stop coming. I'll still, I was there <laughs> twice this year, and I will be there again often. Table 13. Good afternoon. My name's Craig Jeffrey. I'm the director of the Australia India Institute. I had a question about arts and culture, which you mentioned, Peter, in the context of talking about the diaspora, but I'd be interested to hear from the whole panel uh, their reflections on the importance of arts and culture in terms of supporting the developing economic relationship with India, what that might imply in terms of the role for government and for other organisations. I also wonder, just looking ahead to 2035, whether arts and culture might become a really important economic sector driving the relationship between Australia and India. I'm flabbergasted at the popularity, for example, of the literary festivals, not only in Jaipur, but also increasingly in, in even small towns around India. And that type of reflection spurs me to think, well, maybe arts and culture, coming from Melbourne, this is, you know, Melbourne's been driven so much by that kind of um, initiative, whether that's going to become really crucially important for the Australia and India relationship by mid-21st century. Thanks. Peter, would you like to go first? Oh, Ashok. Ashok, go first. You went, you went to Jaipur last year. Sure. Look, I, I, have, I do have a strong view on this. If the economic relationship between India and Australia doesn't flourish in the next 10 years, it doesn't matter what happens in any other space. The key and the foundation of a relationship between these two countries has to be an economic foundation. And I think we need to have a laser-like focus on building that to the next level because it does not exist today. Tell us what you really think, Ashok. <laughs> Peter? Correct. 
Um, well, I, I broadly share that Marxist view of, uh, <laughs> of, of relationship building. Um, and no, I mean, the, I mean as, as, as is inherent in, in economic strategy, it accords a priority to the economic relationship um, above and beyond others. But um, arts and culture fits into uh, relationship building. I mean, what, what we're saying is if we want to get to where we need to get to with India, uh, it means uh, building a very different type of relationship uh, through many, many different ways. And one of those, I think, uh, does have a role for arts and culture because uh, we do need to have a better knowledge of each other and understanding of each, each other. And that is a avenue, an avenue where uh, we, can, we can get to that point. And there is, I mean, there is a creative industries, economic... Uh, thread that runs through it, although I don't think it'll be of the same scale as those other areas. We're running down in question time. Question up here. Thank you very much, Cedar. So the, the shorter the questions, the yeah. more questions we get in for the next five okay. minutes. Thanks very much, Cedar, and all the panellists. Uh, my name is Pallavi Sinha. I'm here at a personal capacity as a lawyer and academic invited by DFAP. Thank you very much. But I also serve on the New South Wales Council for Women's Economic Opportunity, which is chaired by the New South Wales Minister for Women. And I'm also one of the chairs of the Women in Business chapter, New South Wales, Australia, India Business Council. So my question relates to implementation. Uh, Mr. Varghese, as you mentioned, that's an area of interest. Um, I'm driving an event coming up on the 6th of September with uh, Harinda Sidhu, Her Excellency, the Australian High Commissioner to India. And I'm wondering if that could be a platform to drive a bit of communication about women and business and growing that relationship between Australia and India, particularly as one of the outcomes for that forum. Well, there's a DFAT table, and if you talk to Paul Myler, I'm sure he'll arrange that. He's sitting beside you. Um, question at the back. Hello, my name's Annika. I work for First State Super in the private equity portfolio. My question is around social and uh, environmental governance that relates to investing in India. Shamara touched on this briefly, but um, I think one of the big concerns for super funds is the governance related to investing in India. And you've mentioned there's been a lot of changes, but I was wondering if you could go into a bit more detail to what those changes actively are and how they impact um, an Australian investor wanting to ethically invest in India. Um, yeah, look, like all regions that we invest in, we really have to focus on ESG as a factor and in varying economies as varying challenges. Um, as I said, we've invested in 53 assets in India now. We've generally found that we've managed to get very good governance working with the partners we work with. There have been issues and I think as Peter said, India has the same British common law system that we are accustomed to. There's accountability but as he said, the challenge is the process of holding people accountable can take time. Um, so, you know, like any country that's developing, all these things are evolving. Um, we are trying to do our bit to bring standards that we encounter around the world to India. So that's why I mentioned our people are very passionate about this, the work we're doing on road safety, etc. Um, we focus on workplace health and safety globally and the standards we find around the world we try to bring to India. But um, I don't think it's on the worst extreme of countries we invest in, but it's on a journey. And our last question from table one. Good afternoon. Dipin Rugani, immediate past chair of the Australian India Business Council. Peter, first of all, congratulations on a wonderful report. Um, it's definitely needed, um, and um, I'm delighted that it was called by the Prime Minister, so it's gone to the highest echelons of government in Australia. Um, one of the things that I think is important is we talk about business and we're talking in this report about how Australia can engage India. I think the big issue is how India is going to engage with Australia. Now we have a lot of Indian businesses that are operating in Australia doing very well, uh, particularly the IT sector, but we don't actually promote that well in India. I think marketing is something that we really need to do. And sitting next to Philip Lowe, there's a very good example here of how the Reserve Bank has engaged an Indian company. So I think get, getting that message back to India is important. The other aspect is um, the news that actually gets back to India about Indian companies operating in Australia is not positive. So my question to you is how do we engage government, the BCA, a, big, a bigger corporate in, uh, Australian customer, uh, 
businesses to hold hands, if you want to call it that, or assist Indian businesses to do better and be seen in a positive light back into, a, in, into India. Hence, um, you know, uh, attracting the attention of Indian government and Indian businesses to come here more. Peter, do you want to move from Marxism well, to National Socialism? <laughs> well, clearly, um, you know, we do need um, India to uh, have a strategy for Australia, and some of the issues you've raised, Dippin, uh, would presumably be, uh, be covered in that strategy. Um, I think there probably is an issue about the experience of Indian companies in Australia, uh, I don't think that's necessarily a systemic issue, uh, but nevertheless, uh, for a variety of reasons, there have been uh, a number of Indian ventures in Australia which haven't gone uh, as uh, well as uh, those who started it would, uh, would want. Um, there's always going to be, I think, an imbalance in um, the effort that Australia puts in and the effort that India puts in. Uh, and that simply reflects our relative positions and sizes and the nature of our international engagement. Uh, but I think it is important to get to the heart of your question uh, that the Australian business community is using what I hope will be a growing relationship with India to send messages about the ease of doing business in Australia. I mean, we talk a lot about the the challenges about the ease of doing business in India, but you know we should remember that we also need to get messages out about what the Australian business environment is. Uh, and while I think uh, while I think there are many positives in our business environment, like everything, it's not perfect. So uh, I think the more we can use those strengthened channels to get those messages out, the better. But there's no simple answer to it. Um, so can I ask you to thank uh, the panel? Um, for their great contribution on an important relationship.